Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have five more important papers in organic synthesis, this time for the month of June. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you like this type of content so that you see next month when I post the next video in this series. So the first paper for this month is a new way to remove triphenylphosphine oxide. Now, it was recently reported that you could use zinc chloride to remove triphenylphosphine oxide. However, in this paper, the authors use calcium bromide. The lab that they worked in had also used magnesium chloride, but they found that when they were trying to remove the TPPO in THF, it didn't work. However, when they used calcium bromide, it did work. And so you can see in this scheme here, they have their reaction, which contains TPPO. Upon treatment with calcium bromide, it's stirred for uh, some time. And then subsequently, the reaction is filtered, and usually they're able to remove almost all of the calcium bromide TPPO complex. And so when they looked at magnesium chloride, they found that several solvents did work, but usually they had to use a lot of ethyl acetate or toluene. Here you could see when they had co-solvent mixtures, they had to have a large amount of ethyl acetate to be able to remove most of the TPPO. However, when they used calcium bromide, they were able to use ethyl acetate with and without THF. Here you can see ethyl acetate works decently well on its own. However, when they did THF, you can see almost all of the TPPO was removed. Now, the important consideration about TPPO is it's used uh, as a byproduct, or it's formed as a byproduct rather, in a number of reactions, such as the Apel reaction or the Mitsunobu reaction. And so it's often a challenge to remove TPPO. Um, if we're doing bench scale research, quite often we can remove it via chromatography, although this is sometimes challenging. And when you're doing much larger scale chemistry, chromatography is not practical. So the crystallization is kind of why they're trying to remove it in their case. And so they also screen additives. So they have TPPO with triphenylphosphine and some additives, and they show that they're able to successfully remove the TPPO from all of these compounds with the exception of n NBS, as well as imidazole and uh, toluene sulfonic acid. So this is a decent method, and it'll be exciting to see more people use this in the future. Now, the second paper for today is the CH magnesiation of various aryl compounds and heteroaryl compounds. And this is a really cool paper. I think this is almost as cool as the EPIN paper that we talked about in the last episode. If you didn't watch last month's episode, I'll put a card to it here. So in this reaction, where typically you might expect that Grignards are formed from aryl halides, in this case, they prepare an LDA analog where it's instead just like magnesium bis diisopropyl amide. And so they get really good selective CH uh, magnesiation or metallation instead of getting typical uh, insertion you might expect. And they're able to do this in the presence of aryl fluorides, aryl bromides, and aryl iodides. And it's quite an impressive paper. They also tolerate a wide range of functional groups. The magnesiations occur at room temp. They don't require ultra low temperatures. Sometimes they use elevated temperatures. Um, and they demonstrate that these Grignards can be coupled with a lot of different electrophiles. So the cool thing here is they're able to make, you know, sterically hindered tertiary alcohols via addition to ketones. They're also able to do cross-coupling reactions with allyl bromides. Additionally, you can see some other reactions such as the iodination of this uh, nucleophilic species. And one of my favorite things here is that they're able to tolerate a number of uh, ester derivatives, which would not normally be tolerated. So here you can see they have a terpetal ester as well as an amide, and they don't get any coupling of their Grignards to those groups. In, th in those cases, what they found was adding a little bit of THF prevented side reactions. So in the third paper for today, um, what we see is the cross-coupling of activated acids or activated esters with uh, aryl iodides and bromides. And so this is done in the presence of nickel. This is kind of an extension of the earlier work from this group. So the products that they form using this methodology include quaternary centers containing various interesting scaffolds such as bicyclopentanes, as well as uh, azoles of various types. So here we can see this is the general reaction. They do this with both heryl and aryl and heteroaryl halides. And here you can see they generate cyclopropane derivatives as well as BCP analogs, which are challenging to functionalize using existing methodology, although this is an area of interest that a lot of people are looking at, as well as some other interesting tertiary systems. So if effectively what they showed is that depending on how challenging it is to reduce the species to thalamide, as well as the radical that's generated, the more challenging it is, they generally tended to get increased yields. And so here you can see they look at various substituents on the thalamid, where effectively they just have this R group, which is either um, a proton, a methoxy, a methyl, or some other group. 
And you can see in most of their screening reactions, they found that the methoxy group worked best here, although there's one exception here where just the methyl group worked better. And so they showed that you could use this for screening reactions. So in this case, you can see there's this N-methyl indazole with a bromine at some position on the ring. And then they show, depending on which aryl bromide that they used, under different sets of conditions, they were able to obtain better or worse conversions. And so the idea here is that if you wanted to screen a library of compounds, if you're trying to identify conditions to start producing some amount of material on a you know, maybe gram scale, so you can start testing out subsequent chemistry, let's say you're developing a drug, this could be uh, an amenable process. So the next paper is the hydroborative cyclization of enines. And so in this paper, what the authors were able to do is demonstrate that ruthenium is able to mediate an addition process that generates a five to seven membered ring containing a pendant cyclopropane group, as well as a B-pin and a hydride. And so the cool thing about this is that they take a relatively accessible starting material, they produce a chiral product, although this is a racemic synthesis, and they also still have a functional handle that you can do subsequent chemistry with. Additionally, the cyclopropane can do subsequent chemistry depending on what you want to do. So this is kind of a cool methodology. You can see these are the general types of scaffolds that they obtain, and you can see that the functional group tolerance is fairly good, and they also show that bicyclic systems can be formed, uh, or tricyclic systems rather in this case, and various protected alcohols, esters, and so on were tolerated. Furthermore, they show that instead of requiring an n tosyl group, as most of their substrates have, they also demonstrate that cyclopentane derivatives could also be prepared. Now, they show that once they form these products, they can be diversified through traditional cross-coupling chemistry or through uh, oxidation to afford an alcohol or conversion to other boron-containing derivatives. Uh, as well as some subsequent chemistry where the cyclopropane is converted into a methyl group and the B-pin group is eliminated. So the mechanism of this reaction, they did a bunch of computational work and some deuterium labeling studies, and I'd encourage you to go check out that paper yourself. But effectively what occurs is initially once they have the active ruthenium catalyst, it's able to uh, coordinate this alkyne, and through the addition of a pinnacle borane, they're able to form a metallocyclopropene. This metallocyclopropene is then able to undergo a reductive elimination to afford a metallocarbonyl. This metallocarbonyl is then able to undergo a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition with this alkene to form a metallocyclobutane, rather, metallocyclobutane. And through one final reductive elimination, the cyclopropane ring is formed. Now, in the alternative pathway, they undergo a 2 plus 1 plus two cycloaddition, where this uh, metallocyclopentene is formed. Uh, they also show some other possible intermediates, but these don't seem to be as relevant in um, the actual process which occurs, but both the black and the purple process could occur. Once this uh, metallocarbonyl is formed, it's then able to undergo oxidative addition with uh, pinnacle borane. The the B-pin group is able to connect to the carbon, and through a final reductive elimination where the hydrogen displaces the ruthenium, uh, they are afforded with the product 2A here. So this is quite a quite an interesting reaction, and it's cool to see ruthenium used in this context. Now, the last paper for today is a total synth paper. I know there's many of you out there who are fans of total synthesis, so you'll be happy to see I included a total synth in this uh, episode. Now, personally, I am not too interested in the activity of the products, but rather the chemistry that was used to make them. I think there's a lot of really good chemistry in this paper, and if you like seeing clever strategies and good uses of reactions, this is definitely the paper for you. So in this first reaction that I want to talk about, they take this uh, ketone and they convert it to a hydrozone, and then subsequently treat it with pyridinium tribromide, and this affords them with the vinyl bromide. And this is a really cool reaction from an obscure paper in 1971. So this is a cool strategy. I don't know how they even came across the strategy, but it's interesting to note that they selectively form a hydrozone on this ketone in the presence of this other ketone, uh, as well as totally not brominating that other alkene. So this is, a, this is a, quite an impressive transformation in my opinion. Another reaction that I really liked was their intermolecular Diels-Alder reaction. Now, in their case, if they tried any other alkyne, such as propargyl alcohol or um, analogs of acrylates, they didn't get any successful conversion to the benzene in good yields. And so, in their case, it was necessary to install this TMS and then do subsequent chemistry afterwards. Okay, another reaction that they did that I really liked was the Suarez oxidation. And so, under typical Suarez oxidation conditions, they were able to do a macro etherification. And once this iodide is displaced, the alcohol can attack, forming their ether. So this is kind of cool. Now, there's a few more reactions that I thought I should highlight from this paper. One of them is the, the bromodesylation, which isn't that interesting, but that's just like a clever trick for getting uh, 
selective bromination of an arene. And as well as this lactinization under acidic conditions, it's kind of rare to see that, but maybe that's not too surprising for most people. I thought this was just kind of cool. And uh, one of the other reactions that they did that I really liked was this Rieche formulation to install a ketone on carbon-13, or an aldehyde on carbon-13, rather. And if you're familiar with my video on Bayer Villager oxidations, which I'll include a card to here, when you treat an aldehyde with Bayer Villager conditions, you'll actually obtain a phenol. And so that's what they did, and they got their phenol that way. So that's kind of cool. Now, in this example here, they do a pretty cool reaction where first they do this obscure ruthenium-mediated oxidation to convert this benzylic position to a ketone. It's also worth noting that they do that in the presence of another benzylic position, which wasn't touched, as well as another benzylic position, which wasn't touched. So that's fairly cool that they did that in 46% yield. And then subsequently, they do a methoxy carbonylation using a palladium-mediated uh, carbon monoxide insertion into that bromide. So quite an impressive transformation overall, and I think there's a lot of useful chemistry to be seen here, and I'd encourage you to look at the whole paper. So I have some honorable mentions for this episode. These ones didn't quite make the cutoff, but they're still papers worth reading, especially if you have the time. The first one is the conversion of um, sul sulfinamides into sulfonamidamides, which is kind of challenging to say. These kind of could have some application in drugs. The next paper is the conversion of 3,6 anhydro sugars into interesting difunctionalized analogs. There's also a new paper from E.J. Corey where he shows us some neat chemistry of nitrosyl triflate as well as nitrous anhydride. There's this other cool paper involving BCPs where they convert aldehydes into BCPs using propylene. There's also a new Phil Barron paper where they uh, demonstrate that dialkyl carbonyl esters uh, could be formed using nickel cross-coupling chemistry. And another total synthesis that's worth looking at is the synthesis of pleuromutulin. So if you like this episode, it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. And I hope you have a great day.